So again, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Paul Thurnborough, one of our NUP reserve officers for the North East Wales, um, is going to, like I said, is going to be um, doing this talk tonight on the ecology, ecology and management of upland heaths. Uh, and we'll be talking about the origins of the vast upland landscapes we have, how they are at risk, and what we are doing to preserve and enhance them. So, Paul, without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. You know, people don't want to hear from me; they want to hear from you, mate. So. Uh, I'll here we go. I'll pass it over and I'll turn my camera off, but I'll still be here the whole time, mate. Okay. Okay, marvellous. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for um for this rescheduled presentation. Um, <clears throat> so the um the format I'm going to take is I'll go through um what a heath is, what the different types of heathland are. Uh, then we'll take a little look at uh the threats to heath. And uh, and the management opportunities and tasks on heathlands, and then I'll use I'll finish up uh, with using Gorseman Cluid, which is uh, one of our nature reserves out near Clinbrenig. It's our uh, biggest reserve at two hundred eighty hectares. Um, I'll use that as a, a case study, an example of uh, of how we manage our um, our upland heathland sites. So. Um, so to start off then, uh, what is a heath? Well, heath is a man-made habitat. Um, mostly, this is mostly the case, obviously the species that we find on heathland had to come from somewhere. And um, before the conditions were made for, for more widespread heathland, uh, you'd find uh, heath communities on cliffs and in, in rocky communities. But they've become much more widespread um, with uh, with man. So they, they they came about originally through Bronze Age forest clearance. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any images that uh, that didn't have restrictive image rights on them to show that. So this is a a modern day uh, clearance on a heath. But we're talking we're talking around seven thousand to three thousand years ago. Um, and a bit more recent in Scotland. Um, so these these habitats are uh, relatively recent in in the sort of uh, the larger scale of things, but still well established. And um, the the pre existing woodlands, the the forests that we would have had, they'd have been cut for firewood, um, and then peat would have been removed and uh, and taken for burning. Uh, gorse, which would have sprung up in the um, uh, in in the uh, clearances that would be cleared for for fodder and heather turves would have been used for fuel so um the whole uh the whole range of resources were were harvested there'd also be grazing so livestock grazing uh where livestock would be brought out during the day and then brought back in at night so there was a movement of nutrients from the outfield to to the infield and there'd also sometimes be uh burning this this might have been accidental um, but it also stimulates new growth, new heather growth for um, uh, for grazing livestock. But as a result of um, of burning and of these other processes, the clearance that impoverished the soils and it acidified the the soils. So, um, so it leads it leads to these infertile acidic soils. Now, there's there's two very important axes on defining um uh defining habitats and, and soil conditions uh one is uh nutrient enrichment so if you are uh trying to farm the land you might artificially enrich it with uh with fertilizers and uh the other is uh ph so um uh, so if if you're farming, you enrich it with fertilizers, and that allows you to uh, to grow uh, the key crops that you're after more strongly. But actually, nutrient poor land is is always much better for biodiversity uh, because the different plants are competing for uh, for all the different nutrients, and they've got different tolerances to to limits on on different nutrients. So, um, so you don't end up with just uh, monocultures and 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 rank uh, habitats, you end up with a much more diverse habitat. Now, um, when we look at pH, so 
the calcareous grasslands are much, much more species rich than uh, than acidic grasslands, um, which is what we're looking at uh, it, with with heathland habitats and moorland habitats. Um, but uh, but the species that we get in these uh, these low pH, low nutrient habitats are much uh, are relatively rare um, and uh, and very distinctive. So we we've got these these low pH, uh, low nutrient environments, and the soil tends to be very shallow. Um, and there, there's not much vertical mixing. Uh, it's not very um, uh, amenable to earthworms. So there's less uh, uh, mixing. And I've put up here the, the etymology of heath from the Middle English and then from the, the Old English, which I won't try to, to pronounce. Um, but it, it means untilled land. Um, and this this is um, significant because it, it means it's not suitable for growing crops. It's just suitable uh, for for grazing. Um, although, as, as some caveat to that, that there were agricultural improvement made in the 1800s, particularly in the lowlands, which have brought uh, uh, more heath, particularly lowland heath, into cultivation, um, which has been... Uh, a, a loss of that habitat type. So these these heathland sites uh, with their their infertile acidic soils, they lead to a very distinct vegetation community. You get uh, your ericaceous species, um, your 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 heathers. Uh, you get uh, things like bilberry and crowberry. You get dwarf scrub like um, uh, gorse and juniper. Uh, you get bracken as well on these acidic sites, um, and uh, purple moor grass is a very dominant grass species across these um, uh, these habitats. And um, oops, sorry. Uh, and there's also a um, uh, the, there's there's a, an absence of trees, although that's a a dynamic status because there, there's a there's a succession process and if there isn't active um active management through grazing or or some other system that we'll look at later um then trees will come in and change the habitat towards um uh, some type of woodland so looking at the heathers that we get um there's there's three main species certainly in uh, North Wales. These are the three species that you'll encounter: the cross-leaved heather, uh, Erica tetralix, uh, what's typically typically just called heather or ling heather, Calona vulgaris, the common heather, and uh, bell heather, uh, the Erica cinerea. Um, so these these are our three key species. Um, uh, typically. Um, the the ling will be the the most common, but it will depend a bit on your um on the conditions of your site. Um, so there's also uh, an important axis alongside the um uh alongside the nutrients and the uh, acidity axes, which is wet and dry, and uh, typically in a landscape you'll get a mosaic of uh in, which includes both wet heath and dry heath. Um, now, uh, in terms of our heathers, there's uh, there's some uh, there's some preference uh, for the uh, the different sort of wetness, the different uh, hydrologies for these different species, which contributes to uh, to why you get predominantly uh, ling typically, which is is quite tolerant of a range of um, of habitats, and the other two are a little bit more specialised, but they do they do all overlap. Um, in terms more widely of on this wet and dry axis, um, at the very wet end, you you simply get bogs, um, and uh, you can see there there's uh, cotton grass growing in, on the left hand side there in in that um, field or bog. Um, then you get these wet flushes uh, where they're uh, perhaps more um, temporarily wet or the the water isn't. Um, uh, so soaked into the ground, these uh, tend to be quite rush dominated. Um, and then where, where it's a bit drier, uh, you get into your uh, sort of heath proper. Um, but there is there is overlap between uh, these 
uh, these habitat types. And, and you, as I say, you get them in the same landscapes. Um, in the in the wetter areas, um, uh, you get bog mosses as well, uh, sundew, bog asphodel, um, species like this. Now, it also means then that uh, the component parts of um, of these heathland habitats are vulnerable to changes in hydrology. Um, you can get this through uh, through development, uh, where it. Um, uh, roads or, or uh, buildings will um, will cause rerouting of um, of, uh, of of water in the water um, uh, catchment, um, and it also means with with these wetland habitats they can be vulnerable to uh, pollution as well, um, or particularly sensitive to that. So, an another key distinction that we have is uh, between upland and lowland heath. Um, so you get heathland uh, for all the way down from sea level, all the way up to about a thousand meters in altitude. Um, after that, it gets, um, uh, the conditions get a bit too harsh. Um, and upland heath, the boundary between upland and lowland heath has somewhat arbitrarily been uh, uh, is sort of generally considered around 300 meters in in altitude um and uh, the the lowland heath is is a much rarer habitat than than we get in in up uh, than than upland heath so we also quite often refer to moorland um in in the same sort of breath and somewhat interchangeably with um uh, with heath so moorland is an upland landscape and it will include upland heath, but it also includes acid grassland, uh, upland uh, calcareous grass, blanket bog. Um, it includes th that wider um, upland um, acidic landscape. Uh, lowland heaths, as I say, they're, they're relatively rare um, and I think potentially it's because they're more suitable for uh, for farming. Um, they they are quite infertile and free. Well, they are quite infertile. You can get free draining and seasonally wetland there. Um, but I think, uh, as I was saying earlier, with the 18th century um, improvements in uh, in farming technologies, that they've maybe been enriched and brought back into um, agricultural use. Whereas the, the upland habitats that we've got, um, they're much more extensive. You get them over large swathes of habitat, so uh, of, of land rather, so um, uh, around the, the Brennig area, um, there's a, 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 a big, big swathe there of upland uh, moorland. Um, and looking back on our on our wet to dry axis, um, so you can see on the little, um, chart I've put up there. So on the wetter end, you get your blanket bog in the upland, you get uh you get Myers in, in lowland. Um these are areas where you get more um uh more moss growth and uh, more sphagnum. So it lends itself to active peat formation. Uh where, where it gets drier and you've got more heather rather than moss. Uh heather will still form a, a peat soil. Um, but it's a it's a much shallower um, uh, depth of peat that you get from uh, from heather rather than from uh, from wet uh, mossy um, uh, habitats. So uh, and and wet uh, wet upland tends to be uh, commoner than dry. Uh, I'm not. I I think this might in part be because we get a lot of um, these. Uh, wet, uh, acidic um, upland habitats in Wales and Scotland, um, where where it's very wet. Um, but you'll you'll see a difference between uh, steep slopes and uh, shallower areas, um, where uh, where water is is funneled into um, a sort of uh, gullies or where it's dispersed over um, sort of a wider um, a wider sort of uh floodplain almost as it as it uh moves downhill so and the, these upland habitats so as opposed to the 
the lowland heath um they as as they're not farmed they're integrated or they're not um farmed agriculturally they're integrated into uh countryside economies so um here in North Wales, it's uh, a, a lot of sheep farming, uh, sheep country. And we'll have a look at the the implications of that uh, later in the presentation. And uh, you also get large shooting estates that um, uh, that maintain upland moorland habitats as well. Um, so, uh, in addition to that distinction, uh, there's another process which I've, I've touched upon which is succession which is this dynamic process so um having said earlier that there's an absence of trees on on these heathland habitats uh they will uh they will break in they will find a way in if um uh, if allowed to do so so uh looking here on this slide you can see the progression from low succession uh where you've got acid grassland um and that will be kept open uh, by grazing by sheep grazing most likely you can see in the background of that picture uh there is uh there are clumps of heather so you can see even on on that landscape there is a a matrix between lower succession and then this sort of mid succession habitat where you've got the heathland um so you can see on that middle photo where we zoom in on um on a section of heath uh You've got a little bit of um, uh, of rough grass uh, interspersed throughout the uh, the image, um, and there's a few uh, a few trees, a few little saplings there starting to come encroach that we can see in the foreground. In the background, there you can see older, more mature mature trees that have become established. So that that's a site where it is uh, distinctly mid successional. It's definitely a, a heathland habitat, but you can see that process of su succession coming in and then if we look on that uh, final slide um, which I've labeled woodland uh, so that looks like um, uh, birch woodland that's coming in and you can see the general habitat type there um, is uh, is heathy um, but you can see that's an area where birch has been allowed to uh, to colonize and uh, become well established and you can see in the background as well uh, clearly an upland area um but patch large patches with with trees there as well so uh this successional process and it can be knocked uh it can be brought forwards and backwards so um uh you can remove trees to restore heathland uh you can uh graze uh the land to uh to try and control saplings coming in if you've got a uh, a very low successional land um just acid grassland like in that first photo you can uh, reduce your grazing pressure um, and allow the heather to succeed and to come in um, so it's a dynamic process it's something which can be tweaked and brought brought uh, up or down as depending on on what your management goal is so that gives us an overview of um of uh of heathland habitats and what we're looking at there so so why why do they matter why are we interested in these heathland habitats especially as uh, as i say they're they're a lower biodiversity value than um uh than calcareous grassland for example an equivalent low um low nutrient grassland on calcareous land will have a much much higher species richness um but the importance here is it's value for rarer species, specialist species for for this acid um, uh, acid environment. So uh, you get plants like cotton grass, bog mosses, sundew, bog asphodel, um, and various rushes as well. In terms of invertebrates, fifteen percent of British ground beetle species are found in moorlands. Twenty percent of British spider species are found in moorlands. Um, these heathy habitats are excellent for reptiles. Uh, adder in particular are uh, uh, important species that, that benefit from it. Um, but you find common lizard as well across them. Uh, in uh, in southern England, you'll get um, you'll get rarer species as well. In the in the lowlands, you'll get um, smooth snake and and sand lizard. Um, uh, but up here, um, uh, it's very important uh, habitat for for adders. 
And then in terms of bird species, there's there's a a, a lot that uh, make use of it. We've got black grouse, red grouse, cuckoos. You've got um, uh, birds of prey like merlins and hen harriers and short-eared owls. Um, and then you've got uh, you've got all the birds like twites, skylark, meadow pipit, uh, and uh, heathlands can be important breeding sites as well for curlew, lapwing, oyster catcher. Uh, so an important habitat across the the range of species from uh, from plants and invertebrates through through reptiles and birds, a, a very important habitat. So, so what are the threats to to our heathland, to our moorland, and and what management approaches can we can we take to it? So, uh, the first thing to mention is agricultural development and overgrazing. So, I've already mentioned about with with lowland heath where um uh where it's it's been intensified uh and and, and enriched and and uh, turned over to to more agriculture um up in uh the, in the in the uplands where we're dealing with moorland habitat um the big problem up here probably is overgrazing so you'll see uh large areas which are stocked with sheep and there'll be acid grassland upland uh, acid grassland um and uh because of the grazing levels the, the the heath isn't allowed to to establish and you end up with a lower biodiversity value than than you would do if uh, if you could have this mid successional habitat or more of a mosaic with with different species coming through there so that that that's a big problem sort of on the landscape level then the next problem uh that uh we encounter is is fires now these fires can be intentional or accidental um so um in terms of intentional that there, there is a uh, a reasonable legitimate management approach to uh, to burn on heathland to uh, to regenerate the heath and we'll talk a bit more about that later in in when we're comparing management options on on gorseman fluid um but there is a risk uh, it, it's not always the right approach and there's always a risk that it could spread. So it does come with downsides, which we'll talk about. Um, it's quite commonly used on shooting estates. Uh, there is a code of practice for um, for how to, uh, to do heathland uh, burning. Um, but it's um, it's not a it's, it's not a straightforward um positive management uh, intervention. We also have big problems with accidental fires being started, uh, be it cigarette butts, be it uh, uh, camping and uh, not putting out fires properly, um, be it uh, uh, littering and broken bottles that might start uh, fires, be it fireworks or uh, bonfire nights, um, uh, any number of ways that, that a fire might start. Um, and so Again, when, when we're looking at management, you've got to consider whether you need uh, fire breaks and, and removing some of the uh, the combustible material because these uh, the 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 heather, the dwarf scrub that the heather is 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 a um, a very dense well, not it's it's um it's a very combustible material and it and it's just a very fuel rich, um so that that's a problem, um and recreational pressures so uh, again that can feed into the um the fire risk um the, the more sites are used um and you you can also the these sites can experience disturbance uh from uh uh from uh from recreational access um which can be more or less uh problematic depending on the site obviously smaller sites will experience a, a higher um density of uh of of disturbance of, of pressure from from access across a, a larger site like for example at Gorseman Cluid where we've got uh the uh the Brennig Trail around the outside and we've got a, a single key footpath doing a circular loop around it. The um the recreational pressure is 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 more contained and and um uh, sort of minimized across the the site as a whole. Um so then forestry is a another big um 
impact on on heath and habitats so uh, because the land isn't of great value for agriculture an alternative to sheep farming is uh, is forestry plantations uh, typically this will be non-native um a coniferous species uh, in in our area sitka spruce is the uh, the main species planted on on these forestry estates and it makes uh, it makes commercial sense it brings uh, it brings some economic value to the land uh, but unfortunately as you can see on this uh, picture you can see the density of of trees there and uh, and it, it's artificially creating this this late successional stage uh, uh, so you, you lose your heathland habitat underneath it um, or it degrades um, and in addition you've got this uh, um, monocrop of, of a single species that's planted up and it's all of the same uh, size class because it's all planted together at the same time and harvested at the same time uh, and additionally uh, typically they're non-native species as well so uh, so even less value um, to the local wildlife where where they're found so that's another um uh another threat to these habitats um so here's just the photo a bit larger uh you can see on the, on the right hand side there um you you've got a, a moorland habitat but uh there it's it's very grassy it's obviously uh more grazed there and less heat established um on this photo here you can see um you've got a heathland habitat but these are sitka spruce that are self-seeding uh into the habitat from surrounding forestry land um and uh these ones are becoming established they're probably looking at them about eight years old or so so they, they're becoming established um and they will uh they will be uh seeding and and you know continuing that colonization process uh, you can see on the right hand side of the screen there there is uh uh, one that's been cut down, one actually in the middle that's been brushed up onto a pile. Um, so uh, it can be managed, uh, but it creates a, a management task there. Um, so in addition to forestry, you've got development and roads. So I mentioned this earlier, but they uh, they can fragment your, your habitat, uh, obviously, where you've got development, you can get direct loss where it's it's been built on, um, and they can also uh, impact on on your hydrology. They can change the hydrology of of the surrounding land, um, so that's uh, a consideration, um, and atmospheric pollution as well um, can uh, can impact on on the on the habitat, and then. Uh, and then finally, under management is a um, is a consideration because we're talking about succession and management here. Um, on on one end of the scale, we started uh, this section of threats and management at the top of the list, talking about um, overgrazing and uh, the risk of if you've got too high a density of sheep uh, for the land in in terms of biodiversity value, in terms of heathland uh, management then it will transition to a low succession environment and it will be maintained at a low succession environment of acid grassland, a, 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 a less uh, species rich habitat type and, and a less um, uh, structurally diverse habitat type than, than the heathland. Uh, so, uh, but on the other end of the scale, if you don't manage it at all, uh, if you don't have grazing or uh, or cutting or burning some some technique to prevent it from succeeding to to woodland, then then that's what will happen. Um, and you can see here on this um, on this slide on your left hand side, you've got uh, this this uh, heavily grazed, uh, more open, early succession uh, successional acid grassland habitat. In the middle there, you've got this heathland habitat. Um, and you can still see at the bottom right of that heathen picture. There is a bit of a rough grassland. There's it's a very small um, picture, unfortunately, but there are little patches of grassland in there. Equally, you can see that there's Sitka spruce um, in the foreground that's starting to colonise. Those are just young ones, probably 
probably not more than two or three years old, those ones in the foreground. But in the background, you can see larger, more established trees. So that's that's a mid-successional habitat that, that's definitely heath. But you can see that succession taking place. Um, equally, on, on the uh, the low successional picture there, you can see in the background, um, you can see that there's uh, sections of heath just uh, just behind this this open open ground. So you can see there that the the sheep grazing is um, is uh, not homogenous. They 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 they'll they'll focus more and they'll keep open those grassland areas. Um, but the density isn't so high that the heathland has been eradicated. There, you've got within that landscape, you've got a mix of um, of acid grassland, of open grassland, and of heath. And then in that final picture, you can see the woodland where um, where well from from the landscape, you can see it, it's a, an upland acidic heathland um, landscape, but uh, there's a uh, a section of, of looks like birch trees, which are a, an early successional spe tree species that will come in, and that they've become quite established there, um, and uh, they they've clearly been there for for a number of years and are spreading out. You can see the the smaller trees in the foreground from them where they're they're starting to establish and take over a bit more heath, and similarly in the background you can see uh, larger areas of. Um, uh, of uh woodland of forestry um looking at the the straight lines i suspect they might be planted um uh but but i can't tell for certain from the the picture so, so that gives us a an overview of um of the 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 threats and the sort of management types that that you'd look at for these these heath and habitats so the, the final point I'll make on this section before I bring it into Gorseman Cluid um, is this heather cycle. So there's there's this cycle of about sort of 15 to 20 years where you start off with uh, sort of bare ground, bare, bare land. Your heather um, colonises, it comes in, you get a few years of this pioneer stage um, where it's very low, very open. Then you come into this building phase. Um, where it's growing, expanding, it's becoming uh, more, uh, it's becoming larger, more structured. And this is sort of, um, you can see quite clearly it's sort of dwarf scrub in this um, uh, sort of phase. Then it's it's maturing. Uh, you start to see uh, gaps coming in it. It becomes more leggy. Um, so this, again, it's, it's very comparable to... Um, uh, hedgerows, for example, and uh, things like hawthorn, that as they get bigger, they, they can become more uh, more leggy. Then you enter this degeneration phase where the um, the sort of middle of the um, the plant sort of gets hollowed out. Um, you get you get some layering, you get some die off, and then you get your pioneer phase again. And so there's there's this cycle, uh, this heather cycle that um, uh, that na that naturally occurs. Um, but within that cycle, as I say, it can be impacted by by management, by grazing, or by burning, uh, or by under management and succession, where uh, where tree species get into that mix, um, uh, or or by cutting as well. So we'll have a look at Gorseman fluid now. We'll have a look at um, how these general principles of of upland ecology apply to this site and how we we are applying them and how we are managing the site so uh this photo was taken uh, a year or two ago but it would be very apt for at the moment we were up there on tuesday and it was uh very beautiful and very snowy and very cold um very exposed um you can see here um you can see the general landscape and just on on the left of the uh, the board there, you can see some of the heather, some of the heath poking through. So if we take a look at the habitat types that are supported on the site here, um, the uh, the dark purple, the sort of claret colour on this map is uh, mature heath, mature or over mature heath. The uh, sort of slightly pinker 
uh, purple, the lilac purple, um, is uh, where there was uh, either younger heather or a bit more of a um, a heather grassland mix. Um, then uh, sort of down at the bottom and and up at the the top, you've got the smaller areas still of a, a sort of very pale lilac colour. This is a much more open um, mix of heath and grass. Um, uh, so the density of heather in there is is much lower, um, but it's still a very uh, heathy sort of habitat. There's, there's, uh, um, it's distinctly heathland character rather than grassland character. Um, then we've got the field, the, the sort of uh, big green rhomboid, I think, uh, in the sort of lower middle, um, which is... Um, uh, which is acid grassland that would be very uh, similar in um, in appearance and context to a lot of the acid grassland on surrounding land. Um, and then we've got a couple of patches of woodland that are sort of highlighted in a, a darker green. There's one in the top right hand corner of uh, of the map, uh, which is a deciduous wood. Um, it's only a small component of the site. It's not the sort of key. Um, key feature of the site by by any stretch um but it was decided to to maintain it uh just for a diversity of of habitats um on the the bottom section of uh of the map there's another green strip um and that is uh, uh quite mature sitka um uh, sitka trees um but we've maintained we've retained them because just off screen uh so sort of to the south of there is where we've got the the Brennig osprey uh, nest platform, and so we're retaining that uh, section of woodland um, as a screening to um, to reduce the risk of disturbance to um, to the ospreys. Uh, longer term, probably what we want to do is underplant it with uh, with native species, with broadleaf species, and um, progressively manage out the Sitka and replace them with these uh, native species as they grow uh, to a size and, and form that they will offer the screening. Um, but that's the one sort of um, exception to my rule on this site that uh, that, we, that we'll get rid of the, the Sitka. And then the areas that aren't coloured in, the sort of um, uh, sort of brownish colours, so that they are wetter areas. So you can see I've, I've marked onto this map uh, in dark blue and, and pale blue um, streams and watercourses that run down uh, through the site. And then the, they, tend, they tend to be in the steeper areas where you've got um, a bit of uh, sort of canalisation and, and, and gullies forming. Um, and then these areas around them are wetter. And so the, they are more dominated by rushes um, than uh, than the heather habitat rushes more mosses uh, and and less less heather so you'll find if you're on site you'll find these areas are more open and in that sense easier to walk through uh, but also much wetter underfoot and quite spongy and in that sense uh, less pleasant to walk through um, and we find that the sheep will preferentially graze in these open areas and they're less keen on the um, on the denser stands of heather. Um, Although once the cutting regime gets in, then we find the sheep are exploring more. So we'll we'll talk about more about that when we're looking at the sheep. So these are our habitats that we've got on on gorse. Um, and you can see, as I say, the the distinctions there between um between wet and dry um and um and between sort of successional stages where you've got uh, more woodland coming in, uh, more open. Uh, you've got the range from from mature heather uh, through to more managed heather, through to more open heather, down to grassland. Um, so you can see a range of these sort of axes that we we covered earlier. So this is just looking again at the, the dry to wet. Um, you can see perhaps a bit more clearly without the, uh, the colours uh, marking on the, the heather habitat. Um, you can see that sort of hay colour that is um, uh, the, the wetter habitat. Um, that's the, the rushes, they look quite um, 
ironically they look quite dry from the aerial photos but they're uh, they're showing up the, the wetter habitats and this is zooming in on uh, a northern section of it and you can see here um, the sort of darker like in the bottom left corner you can see the darker uh, dense clumps of heather uh, in the sort of uh, top right, I guess you can see uh, a richer green where you, it's it's quite grass dominated, and then uh, sort of running diagonally down from top right to centre, um, you can see uh, well, you can see the watercourse actually sort of uh, meandering its way uh, down towards the lake towards Brennig, um, it, but all that sort of hay colour around it that is um, uh, rushes and a more open. Uh, sort of grassland type habitat. Um, so I've put this slide in to to just demonstrate the the upland nature of it. It's, it's sort of um, quite hard to show without uh, sort of a three D map. But these contours, the um, uh, they're twenty meter contours. It's three hundred eighty meters down at Brennig level, uh, and it goes all the way up to four hundred and forty meters at the uh, the dark blue. Um, contour line uh, sort of uh, top left, centre left there um, and a little bit higher um, above that. Um, so remembering back to our arbitrary cutoff from earlier, uh, the whole site is above 300 metres, so it would all be considered uh, upland heath. Um, and now to look at sort of perhaps the most interesting bit, at least from, from my perspective as a, a site manager, is uh, how do we want to approach management of this habitat and the um, the sort of um, uh, the saying is by mouth, by match or by machine. And by mouth is, is grazing, uh, be it sheep or cattle. Uh, by match is burning, controlled fires. Um, and machine would be with tractors uh, and either flailing or topping the heather. Uh, so cutting the, the heather. So which of these do we consider and, and what are the um, uh, what are the implications? So uh, by mouth, by grazing, um, this is an important resource to us. Uh, up at Gorse, we've got a um, uh, a tenant farmer who who grazes the site with uh, with sheep. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of introducing some cattle grazing to the mix as well, which would um, potentially give a more diverse uh, sward structure uh, in uh, in the areas they graze. Um, the, they, they're also potentially a bit more willing to force their way into the heather, so we might get a bit more uh, varied grazing. Um, but uh, there aren't that many compartments marked up on on the reserve in terms of fencing so we'd have less control of it we, we are looking at the possibility of um of no fence grazing um but uh there, there's there's a process to look into there but at the moment uh the site uh is grazed by uh by sheep and we're able to control uh how many sheep we have on site at uh, different times of year um and we can control to a certain extent uh, where they graze. As I say, without lots of fencing on site to compartmentalize it, uh, they have a lot of freedom to choose where they will graze and where they won't. Um, and what we found, and we've had um, botanical surveys done, uh, and, and, they've, and they've shown basically that they will, they will graze well in the open areas, and they, they do seem to... Uh, largely controlled Sitka uh, spruce seeding into these these grazed areas um but um uh, but they won't go into uh, the dense stands of heather so much they they're less keen to break into there um but since we've done heather cuts and um uh, opened up areas to to the sheep then the farmer has reported back to me uh, that there's there's they're showing a greater tendency to go into those uh, those areas that have been cut. So they uh, so they're spreading their grazing effort out a bit more. So they're an option, um, and we we use them. We need to be careful not to overgraze. So um, the map I showed earlier with the big green field, uh, 
that's potentially overgrazed and we might want to reduce the density of uh, of grazing there. Um, but on the site as a whole, our botanical survey suggested that uh, the grazing levels were uh, were about right. Um, and we can just look to keep monitoring that and and tweak them to to enhance it just a little bit further. Now, another option is burning, control burns. Um, now, we're talking very much here about controlled burns rather than uncontrolled fires. So the distinction there is that with an uncontrolled fire, uh, it, it can just spread across the, the site as a whole and um, and you uh, you can have a lot of physical damage in one go and a lot of structural damage because everything will then be regenerating at the same pace. Uh, now, the case for um, uh, for burnings that you can get young heather um, growing quite quite rapidly from from stick and from rootstock and from seed um, and uh, and you get a, a higher uh, nitrogen and phosphorus content than than just cutting and, and unmanaged plants so you can get quite a, a fresh flush uh, after burning um, and you can also cover um, it's quite efficient in terms of the area you can cover compared to uh, compared to cutting although you may still need to cut fire breaks to to control it um, you can also crack open seeds it releases nutrients it gets rid of the arisings so um uh, which which can inhibit seedlings and it, it also um, gets rid of the fuel load as well. So if you're concerned about uh, uncontrolled fires, it's, um, uh, it can help on that front. But uh, but they are quite uh, quite dramatic. You can so like reptiles, for example, are a good example of a, a species that can't fly away. They will suffer direct mortality. Uh, although this is typically from um, from uncontrolled fires, which you get more over summer when they're when they're active, and it can also result well it, by its nature it does result in a very open habitat, um, much less cover, uh, much more uniform, uh, which puts them more at risk of uh, predation. Um, but if you if you've got a large site and you can control the area that you're going to burn and you burn only a relatively small area and you time it. Uh, to when species are more inactive and you keep it away from known hibernacular for, for reptiles, um, then there is a case for it. Um, but at the moment, it's not something that uh, that I'm pursuing. Um, I think that uh, between uh, grazing and machine work, uh, that will produce the results that we uh, that we need on on gorseman fluid. And I don't need to. Uh, I don't need to risk the burning approach at the moment. So, so the, the alternative then is is machine cutting. Um, so, uh, you could, uh, the regrowth potentially of the heather is a little bit slower after cutting than from burning. Um, that might lead to a bit more of a dominance of uh, grass in the mix, a bit of loss of heather cover. Um, uh, but and and you also get in some areas the the first response to the cutting is is your ber berry species and they'll they'll flush they'll be more vigorous um than uh than your heather um but there are studies that have shown that after about ten growing seasons there tends to be little difference between cut and burnt plots so uh so cutting is uh, it's certainly a, a viable way to to approach it, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't incorporate the risks. But you've still got the fuel load. Uh, you still have to be conscious and careful of uh, the risk of accidental fires there. Um, so my next slide here this shows um, the the effect where you can get these flushes of berries. So the brighter green. So on the left on the right hand side you've got outside the reserve, and you you've got um, sort of heavily grazed uh, acid grassland. But on the left hand side there, uh, you can see the darker areas, the sort of strips uh, running through it. That's uh, patches of heather that were not cut, that were left. Um, and you can see little chunks and the arrow and the sort of pie sign that, that were cut from it. But by and large, um, 
they're, they're showing the, the boundaries, the areas that were not cut. Um, and then that sort of um, more sort of a, a, a richer dark green rather than the, the sort of more browny purple color, perhaps of, of the uncut sections, that is uh, bilberry, Vaccinium myrtillis, uh, which has grown back very dominant in, in these sections. And uh, there is heather in there. There is, um, you can see, I mean, it's quite a pixelated photo, but um, but you can see there is that sort of darker purpley brown um, in the mix. But but this is an area that was cut and regenerated largely to, uh, to bilberry. Um, this is another area on the reserve uh, with some sort of fairly uh, experimental cutting um, designs. Uh, I always think this looks like Nazca art from, from Latin America. Um, it's not quite how we would approach it now. So uh, we would we would try to not join up these cut patches because that makes it easier for mammalian predators uh, like uh, foxes and uh, weasels or stoats to uh, to spread through the heath and to uh, to predate in these uh, more open areas. Um, so we would now tend to try and keep these um, uh, the patches that we cut separated from each other uh, rather than linking them up with these uh, these lines. Uh, that said, the main line that you can see running uh, sort of north south with a couple of kinks in it. That's uh, the main footpath uh, running through the reserve. Um, and that actually we've enhanced and widened a bit to uh, act as a fire break. So, uh, so that's showing some historical cutting that was done. So in terms of heather management on the site, uh, so it's 280 hectares of reserve. And of that, there's about 192 hectares of heather. And so the areas that I've uh, I've marked up in colour here um, are heath and habitat. So we've we've got the blue, uh, uh, the blue, the green, the purple, the red, and the tan. Uh, and in principle, to to maintain a uh, a really rich, diverse structure of heather across the the site. Um, in principle, all the heather on the site, minus about ten percent or so, ought to be cut on a on a long term cycle, um, so that we've uh, we've always got patches that are uh, uh, that are pioneer and and low and small, and patches that are maturing, and patches that are degenerating and getting leggy and opening up, um, and uh, and then a fresh new growth as well. So. Um, so what we need to do is, uh, but but we don't want to obviously cut the whole site at once. So, um, so we'll rotate between uh, each year. We'll take one of these colours. So uh, we'll take the green in year one, say, and because we don't want to cut all of the green, we just we want a nice matrix of it. So we'll have like a a pattern within it where we cut a patch and leave a patch and cut a patch and leave a patch and so on. And as you can see, all those patches are, they're not joined up with little corridors or tunnels. Um, so it will be heather that's in the, the matrix between them. Um, and those will be cut patches that will be then uh, excellent basking areas around the edges for reptiles. They might be good um, lacking areas for, for black grouse. Um, and they're improving the diversity of the site. So year one, we'd focus, say, in that green area. Then in year two, we'd focus in the blue area. Year three, in the purple area. Year four, in the tan area. We'll leave the, the red area as a uh, 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 as um, non-intervention to do its own thing so that the whole site isn't being managed. We've got a little bit of non-disturbance on site. And then in year five, we come back to our green area. And so I'm just using this grid in the green area to demonstrate, but um, obviously the same would be happening in the blue, in the purple, in the tan. We'd we'd uh, we'd be doing patches, um, and so we end up with this patchwork where we've got um, uh, heather that was cut one year ago, sitting next to heather that was cut five years ago, or or in year five rather, uh, and then heather that hasn't been cut yet. So we do the same in uh, in the blue, in the purple, in the tan. Then we come back in year nine. 
and we do another section in um, in this green area and repeat year 10, year 11, year 12. And then we come back year 13 uh, to this green area. So at this point, we've got a, a fantastic matrix of stuff that was cut one year ago, five years ago, nine years ago, and just now. Go year 14, 15, 16, and then uh, so it's a 16 or a 17 year cycle because then we come back uh, and we we look at recutting in year one. Um, and it's maybe not as uh, sort of clinical as this with a with a grid, but this shows the the process of having a fantastic. If you look at that color mix um, uh, in the, in the grid, there it shows you've got a lot of different structures, uh, heather structures, and growth stages within that patch, and we get that across the reserve as a whole, um, with the exception of an area that we um, uh, that we keep as non-intervention. So that shows the approach we take with the with the heather management in terms of the the active cutting. Um, and as I said earlier, the the sheep once you've cut these patches, um, once you've cut these patches, you'll get uh, the sheep start to come in and graze uh, into those heather blocks more actively than they they did before. So what we might need to to do is just keep an eye on that and make sure that uh, they're not overgrazing in there um or equally as they disperse throughout more of the site that um uh we lose density elsewhere and, and we find that they're undergrazing elsewhere so we just need to keep an eye on as 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 one management uh sort of process kicks in how it impacts on on any others so there's also tree control that um we need to consider so this slide i'm just going to show some uh, progress that's happening in terms of off-site tree control. Um, so this area of um, forestry land is uh, uh, is about to be felled. Uh, unfortunately for us, it's going to be restocked again with uh, with Sitka. There will be um, a curtilage around the outside of it where it's stocked with some uh, native broadleaf. Um, but at least for a, for a few years, it will reduce the um, the seed pressure from that source. We also got this little triangle here, which actually is on reserve land that uh, was planted up years ago as forestry. So we're going to be uh, looking to, to fell that and uh, and if possible, restore that uh, to Heathland. Um, we just need to work our way through um, uh, the, the processes for doing that. And then there's this section down here, which is um, uh, in the direction from the prevailing wind. Now that, that has been uh, largely felled now, that's on um, Welsh waterland or Cymru. Um, and fantastically, they are replanting, they're restocking, but they're restocking with native broadleaf. So that will provide a little bit of a, a windshield along that um, southern edge of the reserves, which might help reduce um, seed blow from, uh, from elsewhere, from the surrounding forestry. Um, and it will also reduce the, the seed load of this Sitka that is much more dominant, much better at tolerating this habitat than, than the broadleaves are. So it will um, overall, I'm hoping that will reduce our seed load quite considerably. Um, so now looking in the reserve at the management that we've done. Um, so this is, uh, this is a map showing tree control from uh, the season 2021 to 2022. Um, the area in blue we were able to cover uh, largely with our volunteer teams uh, spreading out and doing hand pulling and cutting of smaller uh, seeds, the seedlings that had come in. And the areas in sort of red or sort of salmon pink there, whereas where we went in with chainsaws and we took out um, more established uh, uh, trees, saplings that had uh, come in um, and and taken root and, and uh, got bigger. So uh, obviously, you can cover a larger area um, uh, with a, a, a big number of people spreading out and, and doing the pulling than, than you can do with a chainsaw, which is a bit more because um, you're dealing with bigger trees. There's more more to process. So this is the, the area roughly that we covered um, in season 21, 22. Then uh, that expanded a bit in uh, a season between uh season 22 23 so uh sort of cumulatively those two years are shown in pink and then the area shown in uh blue is what i hope to get cleared 
um, this year, this season, season 23, 24. So we've, we've done quite a lot of work on that already, and I'm hoping we'll, we'll get that section done. And in terms of tree management, I'm, I'm trying, I'm hoping to have a six year rotation, uh, at least on the smaller stuff. Um, so that if we can, if we can keep on that, if we can cover the whole site across six years, that means that when we come back on rotation to the, to the pink area, the area we started on, um, there shouldn't be anything bigger than six years old there to deal with, which means it'll be much more manageable and we can do it with hand tools. So I'm trying to do that on a, um, to, to get this sicker problem under control. And then I'm forward waiting, hitting the big stuff as hard as possible. Uh, so the, the biggest trees and the highest density of trees are in this Southern section. Um, so, while I've got some some budget to help with contractors and I've got support from uh, the reserves team out in the West as well and volunteers that we're training up with chainsaws. Um, I'm trying to hit uh, these these bigger trees now, early in this six year cycle. Um, and I mean, on such a huge site, on 280 hectares, it seems uh, unfeasible that we would achieve um uh, that that we could even consider achieving covering the whole site and removing trees across it um, on a six year basis. But actually, looking at uh, looking at that map and what's marked up, if that's three years, that's halfway through. I mean, and it's also focusing on on the worst areas. It, it'll be a lot of work. It'll be a hard push, but we might manage it. It's not it's not out of the question. So. So that's that's what we're working on. That's that's the push. Um, that brings me to the end of uh, the uh, the management and and the examples that course were included. So this is just a photo of me up there when I was checking on some work. I hadn't taken a coat. I, I thought it was in the van. It was in the other car. Uh, it's it's very exposed, very wet, very windy, very beautiful when you get the weather for it as well. Don't forget your coat. And uh, I'll open it up to, to questions, uh, which I think Mark will uh, process. And then our final slide here, just um, any support is uh, is welcome. And over to Mark. Thank you, Paul. That was fascinating, um, especially fascinating for me because, um, well, you know, but a lot of people in the chat won't know that I've spent for one and a half years working at the Brenning uh, Brenning Osprey project right next door. So, you know, you know, I am I'm, I'm up there looking at that reserve every single day. So understanding um what you're doing up there is just it's just really, 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 really interesting. And you know, I've 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 spoken to you at length about some of the problems with um, the 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 sickness spruce and, and things like that, which you know, and we've had a bit of an influence with Welsh Water, haven't we, through those conversations about how they're kind of moving it forward, um, not just for the Ospreys, but obviously for biodiversity around. So, yeah, the, you know, it was a great, great talk, Paul. I was um, looking back fondly at memories when you were, when you first started that talk about my childhood messing around on the Carnevais and all the different habitats up there, um, you know, ranging from heathland and bogs and all sorts up there. And, you know, it's, it's just really, 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 really nice and interesting. So, but yeah, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll read to these. So, uh, Roger says straight away, uh, does the use of heavy machinery not risk physical damage to the substrate and change the hydrology? Um, yeah, so it, it can do. If you use um, if you're using heavy machinery, then you use um, uh, like wide load tires as well, which will uh, spread it. You you've got the most risk that you'd have. Um, is if it's if it's in um if, if it's very wet and wet under uh underfoot as it were um so like for example last year it was quite wet when I managed to get the uh the tractors out um and you can see some damage along the track but actually on the on the reserve proper so once they were onto the heath um I think the um. I think the the spread of the tires and the sort of protection of the um uh, the, the the heather itself it 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 spread it out and it it was fine but yeah if it, it's it's something that you need to be conscious of and you can you can 
minimize the risk by through timing and uh, most critically is you select your your machinery appropriately to have a, a lower um uh i can't remember the term but uh so so that you're spreading your load out over over bigger tires um and uh and you just get machinery that is appropriate for that task thank you very much um another one is what would you do to add heather to pure vaccine is it vaccinium mert yeah vaccinium mertilis so um so that's bilberry um so you could um you could do if if you get a heather cut um uh from a site that that's that's got more heather if you do say a flail and then collect and then you can take your your drum of heather and you can do uh you can then spread that on your vaccinum area to inoculate it with uh with heather uh, if you do that uh when you've got uh seed load in there uh but also they 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 can take from um uh from sort of layering um so that that would be uh probably the the um the basic principle of it what i what i'm wondering though um because i've seen it on the site is you you get areas where you, you get this dominance of, of vaccinium and i'm not i'm not clear ecologically why that is why it is that 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 has come back so strongly and in favor uh to to, to the heather why why it's been so dominant and one thing that was suggested to me was that if you do a a lower cut on the heather um and you're you're really scalping it and you potentially you're you, you go into the ground as well and you you're really scalping apparently that can um cause the heather to to come back more strongly and if you do a slightly higher cut a less aggressive cut um then that will favor the vaccinium now I, I don't know if that's the case that's something that was suggested to me um but i always wonder where you've got one thing favored over another what what the underlying reason for it is and unfortunately i i don't really know i don't know the habitats well enough i'm still uh i'm still learning but but yeah, I mean, a, a heather cut and spread a bit like a green hay spread would probably be the uh, principle. Um, but I'd look into it in in more detail and um, and and uh, and explore what the what literature there is on it if if it was something that I was trying to undertake sort of in earnest. Right. Uh, next one. Do you have a problem with bracken on this type of landscape? If so, how would you deal with it? On on gorse we don't. On gorse mancluid we're quite lucky in that um, there there isn't very much bracken and and also sort of perhaps unusually there's not very much gorse either. Um, but on this sort of upland heath in particular and lowland heath as well, uh, uh, you you absolutely can get bracken. It can be quite dominant, um, and uh, a bracken is quite difficult, I think, to to manage out completely. Uh, on habitats so um typically you can uh you can cut or you can you can crush um the uh, chemical treatment has sort of gone out of favor because uh as you looks that was the um the herbicide that was used as um you can only use up any existing stock but you can't you're not able to purchase it anymore um so uh probably cutting or crushing or your um are your main options the other option or another option is uh burning um but you need to be with any of these approaches you need to be especially on this sort of habitat conscious of uh of its value for reptiles and you just need to uh bear that in mind on any uh approach that you're taking so that both in terms of timings and specific locations and the extent of uh, any particular habitat type that you you manage that you cut or you burn or you you crush um but yeah th those would be the general approaches that you can consider brilliant thanks um someone else said they're fascinated to understand the importance of convert conserving heath versus increasing species richness by introducing patches of new woodlands for example um especially in light of the biodiversity crisis so i think i think you obviously you covered some of that in the talk didn't you it's 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 
having those different areas, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, so th this is where you need to consider the relative value of um, of your rarer species and your rarer habitats, um, but which sustain less. It's 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 contrasting sort of uh, biodiversity at a at a sort of larger scale where you want to maximize your number of species to to biodiversity where so so no that's not the right way to explain it. so like the the importance of this heath and habitat is it contributes species that you're not getting elsewhere so it's contributing to your overall biodiversity and they they are rarer and this habitat is um is rarer so they've they've got that increased conservation value uh, even though the habitat as a whole supports um a lower biodiversity to to the wider landscape now in terms of um having an increased diversity within that heathland um i'm i'm all in favor of structural diversity in your heather mix so that's why we're looking at um like that that slide i had where where i was showing the the sort of grid and the different colors show, showing how that would impact again if, if you sort of refer back to the um the heather uh life cycle slide um I'm all in favor of that. And I, I love where you've got on a site, you've got topographic uh, features. So you've got areas of wet and areas of dry. Um, that adds a lot of diversity as well. I generally, on this uh, sort of heathland habitat, um, I generally wouldn't be in favor of planting up woodland because it's it's not the priority species or the priority habitat for the um, the uh, the land that you've got. Um, but there, there, there are uh, there are exceptions to that. So, like for example, if you've got a very if if it's overgrazed, for example, uh, you might want to bring it into broadleaf woodland um, rather than overgrazed acid grassland. If it's very dominated in heather, you can uh, not heather, sorry, bracken. Uh, you can you can shade out bracken. You can have a long term uh, process to uh, to transition it from from bracken dominated to woodland. Um, or uh, around uh, Brennig, you've got the um, uh, the Clacanog, um woodland, and you've got um, you've got red squirrels uh, in the area. And so, obviously, uh, having uh, these patches of, of trees and woodlands in the mix is uh, is important. So, um, uh, so while generally, I think, especially in the context of the gorse, I wouldn't be planting up there to, to increase the diversity um uh it's not it's not outright the wrong thing to do um like it, it's i guess context dependent on your landscape and, and your conservation priorities yeah yeah um there's a few more things so roger says thank you very much for the worthwhile presentation uh Faye says thank you for the informative chat uh catherine this has been very interesting i've learned lots thank you very much uh, Julie's um, made, made reference to Bryn Ivan, one of our newer acquisitions of land down on the Chim Peninsula, about there being a heather on the rocky bits where the sheep can't get to. Um, and then uh, another one says, thank you for that thoughtful answer to the last question. Um, uh, and someone else says, on Dartmoor, there's been a lot of talk about how to deal with Molinia purple moor grass. Has that been a problem? Um, I think on Dartmoor they're suggesting cattle as a partial solution and rewetting, not sheep. Yeah, so it's it's a species that can be uh, very dominant in this type of habitat. Um, I don't I don't think it's a problem on gorse, um, but uh, but yeah, it it can be dominant, and probably adjusting your grazing regime would be uh, would be a sensible thing to look at. Um, I'd. I'd I don't think it's a problem here, so I I haven't looked into it further. And Julian's um, put a best way to describe that Julian's but a um a big long question which probably deserves more attention than me and you can probably give it tonight regarding um how NRW kind of manage land and you know could. North World Wildlife Trust and other societies like Synodonia Society um, work together to kind of put pressure on certain management patterns. And I think 
Um, the reason I, I, I don't want to address that in here, Julian, is it's, it's because there are things going on behind the scenes and our um, our strategy for the next um, seven years for, or up until 2030 for the Trust focuses massively on how different organisations can work together, doesn't it, Paul, about how we can get to those because you know we can't do it all independently. So what I'll do with that, question julian is i will um cross it over to paul i've already copied it now so i'll send it over to paul i can get your email and i'll probably crop, copy in um well i'll leave it with you paul actually in the okay. first instance what, what, what i would like to say though like um putting aside the specifics of nrw is um we're, we're very lucky at brennick that uh one of the the big uh landowners that the neighbors of the land is um the Dur Cymru, um a, a state uh, and the the site manager there is um is very pro conservation and we work closely with him on uh on the osprey side of things but also on um sort of uh i guess a holistic approach to to site management and he's uh looking at introducing conservation grazing onto his land and he's where he's done the felling of uh the um, the Sitka uh, adjacent to the reserve it, that's his land where he's he's getting it restocked with with native broadleaf um so within the limitations that he has of being um uh like a, a commercial enterprise i suppose um uh or, or at any rate not not being a, a, a charity with a, a focus on um uh where conservation is our primary goal i think he's doing a, a fantastic job on managing uh the land as sympathetically as possible and uh and working with us um sort of closely across the whole so it, it's really good where where you've got that landowner engagement and you know the, the reserves are an important resource in, in the landscape but but they're they're literally reserves they're little pockets of land so where you've got landowners that are uh that are doing their best and pulling their weight and uh and contributing to to positive management um i think it's it, it's good to see and it's nice to be able to shout it out no thanks for bringing that up paul um um i whilst i was doing that julian i've I've sent i've emailed your question over to paul already so it'll be in there ready for you whenever you can get a chance to look at it paul i know you're busy next few days but i've sent it in there um matt's asking have we done any peak depth surveys on it on the site and has that influenced you, the way you manage it we we have so that there's there's some uh, there's some peak mapping that that exists. I think it's NLW um, maps uh, that we we did a little bit up in uh, the plot of land uh, where there's um, the little triangle of of conifer plantation where we're looking at, at felling that uh, the peat it's it's shallow peat it's not deep peat which is what you'd expect on on heath rather than uh, sort of sphagnum bog. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. It was um somewhere between thirty and fifty centimeters, I think. Um, uh, and you can also see that there's there's areas where there's been erosion by by the lake or along the um the the, the paths, and you you can see um quite a, a thin layer of of peat. So we have done a little bit um uh in 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 the area around the forestry it was to inform our response to um. Uh, to the felling and replanting um, and it also it would inform uh, 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 to some extent whether we want to try and re-wet uh, an area where there's a big ditch running through or whether uh, how yeah uh, how we want to to restore that little bit of land um, but I've, I've not done it across the whole site but um, but we have got some some maps and some indications and and yeah it's it's shallow um heather peat yeah well i think the the, the translation slation of gorse mancured means um bog of gray stone so it kind of suggests it's it's quite a it's not very kind of deep in vegetation and soil on top isn't it just the way it way way it's kind of that's what what its name was from wasn't it yeah so, i mean there are there are wetter patches i mean there, there will be bits where it's deeper uh probably along the flushes but uh like if you contrast it to corsano for example that's got um uh deeper peat 
Um, and and you can see there's there's much more sphagnum on that site. Um, yeah. So it's it's I mean that's over towards Corwen, and that's uh, that's a nice site to to compare as well because there's been a lot of um, the trust done a lot of work there over recent years restoring the site, and um, and it's it's got some interesting contrasting uh, sort of heathy habitats. It's got much more wet heath. Um, it's got a different uh, successional issue in terms of um, it's got a lot of birch and uh, willow. I think regen into it rather than uh, sitka. Um, so it's uh, and it and it's yeah with it being wetter, it's got more sphagnum. So it's it's quite a different site to um, to Gorseman Cluid, despite being quite nearby and sort of quite similar on a lot of uh, a lot of fronts. So just just on the on the on since since Corsasano has come up naturally in the conversation, we actually did a talk. Um, about six months ago, all about Corsasana, which is on our YouTube channel. So, if anyone's interested in Pete and Pete restoration, I will um, I'll put the link to this talk on to, on the YouTube channel. But also, I'll I'll put the link in that when I send you all an email over the next couple of days as well, because that's definitely worth a watch. And and I know Paul, you've had, you've had some input in in the management of that reserve, haven't you? And a little, it's it's more Jordan and, and Richard on that site, but um, yeah, I mean, it's a lovely site. It's got a sort of enchanted fairy forest on it that was stunning to see so yeah well with that site it's quite it, 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 a part of that talk it was fascinating to see you know obviously the, you know the, the trust kind of kind of went in with an idea of what they wanted to do but how they then had to kind of change it when, when once once they got in and started actually doing the work isn't it change it to make it better and work better mm -hmm. for for the area wasn't it there was lots of changes on that one yeah and and i mean sort of when I've been answering these questions like there's some sort of I guess general principles or or ideas that you take to it and and I guess this this talk I started with the the general principles on 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 the habitat and the ecology and then you you look at how you you work with those to to do the management but you get started and then and then you just have to adapt to to the conditions as you find them or to how the habitat responds and you um uh yeah, you 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 monitor and, and react accordingly. No, exactly. And and going back to kind of depths of the peat and things like that, I think when the, when obviously when they first started working on that on at the reserve at Corsa Sarnai, they actually you know they, they kind of had a predetermined idea of where the water was running off and things like that. And actually, when they started doing the work down there, they realised it was literally on a on a bulge going a completely different way to where they thought. So the water was kind of going down both sides rather than a singular way. And that's what just happens, isn't it? When you start getting into the nitty gritty like you have been at course you just start, you just start figuring out different ways to try and make things work so anyway it's half past eight so i'll let everyone i think um get off with this and um, i get a couple more thanks in the in the chat no but thank you all for joining us um you know we only we only put these talks on because people like yourselves book on and want to listen to us so thank you thank you paul it's been fascinating for us and and the people in the chat seem to have really really enjoyed it and like i said it's it is recorded so if there's anything you want to go back on um it will be on the youtube channel in the next couple of days and i'm sure paul will answer any questions if you've got anything um um you can contact me and i can i can forward them on to paul if you've got anything else so thank you very much for joining us and um take care in this cold weather um and yeah stay stay warm it's a bit chilly out there isn't it <laughs> and don't do what paul did and forget his coat <laughs> So thank you all. I'll let you all go there. All right. Take care, guys. Cheers, Paul. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.